Psalm 98. I'm going to be reading that psalm. Why don't we go ahead and stand uh, and, and we'll get our morning exercises in. We're standing and sitting. Let's stand in the, as we read this, the 98th Psalm, beginning in verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I know you're looking at that and going, well, that's an interesting Christmas passage. It's not necessarily a traditional Christmas passage, but uh, you'll understand why I read that in just a few moments. A recent Pew Research poll indicated that even in what we have defined in our culture today, and in the West especially, a growing secularity, more secular than spiritual, we are as we are experiencing here, uh, the celebration of Christmas remains one of the most common and acceptable holidays even for the non-religious, at least it has been in recent years. Now some lament and blame the secularization of Christmas through pop culture, the marketing of the season, the, I don't know, the Lexuses, I guess, that are being given, and the spirited but irreligious Christmas movies that populate cable and streaming services. Uh, then there's the presumed battle over Merry Christmas. I, yeah, you know, we kind of, I think we're maybe over that. So you say Merry Christmas. It's, it's like angry people getting mad at other people for not saying Merry Christmas, you know. Uh, what an attractional Christian that would be. Um, and so you got people who are just, they're, they're just so mad. Keep Christ in Christmas. And I'd just say, hey, why don't you just keep Christ in Christian? That'd be a great start. Let's go there and, and start being Christ-like. But traditions being what they are, many of you have already experienced some traditions this week and, and even today. And one of the traditions of Christmas time is that of singing the carols that we have all grown up to, to learn and, to, and hopefully to love. And sometimes there are new renditions. We already experienced that this morning, an old carol with a new chorus that kind of brought out some new thoughts. Some are good, and uh, uh, you, know, you see that even with ancient hymns like Amazing Grace and others. Some of those new renditions are great and wonderful, and others, to just call it what it is, they're cash grabs for copyrights. But nonetheless, let's move on. They're beautiful, right? But sometimes, I don't know, maybe it's just me getting to a certain age and, and reminiscing a little bit, the old standbys seem to be the best at times. And one of the classic carols of the season is that joy to the world. I think, joy, let me see, I had... I had like eight months of piano lessons. Hold on. And I remember learning, I think, I, I think this is the right song, that if you start at C and just work your way down to middle C without skipping a note, there you go. Everyone can learn. <laughs> David McGuffin is very impressed by that right now. I can see it. I can see it. So, uh, I can do half of one chorus of There's a Fountain and with one finger play Joy to the World. So everybody can play it. Just find a keyboard, C to C. You can do it. Joy to the World. The lyrics of Joy to the World were written by Isaac Watts in 1719. The melody came from a song called Antioch by a guy named Handel. You might remember that guy. He's famous for a music known as the Messiah. You might know the Hallelujah Chorus. So it was adjusted in what we traditionally know now by an individual named Lowell Mason. Now, we've been singing the hymn for years during this season. I'm going to just recite the lyrics now. Because sometimes when you sing them, you don't think about the words as much, right? Just because you know them. And that's good, but sometimes you need to know the words. And, you know, since uh, most of us didn't grow up in third verse Baptist church, that means we skip the third verse of every song we've ever sung in church. I'm going to read all the verses here. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns, let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rock hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, 
for as far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. It's a Christmas carol, right? Would we agree that if we were on Family Feud and had to list the top five Christmas carols, it would probably be up there. Joy to the world is a Christmas carol. It's an interesting Christmas carol because it says absolutely nothing about a manger, about Mary, about stable, about Joseph, about Herod, about angels, shepherds, or even the wise men. In fact, it doesn't say anything about Jesus or baby Jesus. Now some of you are going, what? It speaks of Christ, of course. It speaks of God, of course. But it doesn't speak of your traditional Christmas items. I mean, there's no reference to the nativity here. Yet it is one of the most loved, one of the most sung Christmas carols of all time. And the hymn, the carol, is based on Psalm um, 96. Let me go back to this. In Psalm 96, it says, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all that fills it. Now, did I give you the wrong verse again? I've done that in the past. 98, that's what I thought I was doing. Let's look at this, let's see. No, it's 96, see, that was a test. I read 98 first, but now I'm reading 96. Got me questioning my own notes here, that's what's happening. Two weeks ago, I read the entire wrong, I read right passage, wrong address. So Psalm 96, 11 and 12. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then let shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. You can also go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. It says this. And to Adam, he, God, said, because you have uh, listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I command you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Now, what does that have to do with that? Go back to the third verse of joy to the world, and he's referencing that. I mean, it's just amazing how biblical some hymns are, right? And then there's Psalm 98, which I read earlier. Now, Isaac Watts' lyrics were drawn from Scripture. And over the centuries, as we sing the song, we extol the truth, not necessarily, not, not the truth of the song's lyrics. Make sure I understand this. The word of God is inerrant and immutable and is true from beginning to end. The hymn is a hymn referencing that. So when it references scripture, it is absolutely true. All right, just as any song would be. And like good Christmas carols that truly are hymns of the faith, these, let this just kind of shock us into, into reality. Good Christmas carols that are not just Christmas carols, but are actually hymns of the faith, are not designed to sing only one month a year. What? You can oh come all ye faithful in the spring. Go figure. The declaration of the goodness of God and his great story of redemption throughout the incarnation is not a seasonal thing. And yet we sing it at Christmas, and we should. I'm not mad about it. I really think it's a good thing but I think we could also sing it at other times during the year. Now, let me just go ahead and address some of these. Sometimes traditional Christmas songs are not about Christ at all. I mean, and some of these are my favorite, so I like them. I mean, there's one about a deer with a nose that Gene Autry made popular, and I love that song. I I mean, I had had the the children's book, I watched the Christmas special, I mean, I love that. And then there's um, the one about the snowman with a magic hat. Not exactly scriptural, But the cartoon was one that I always wanted to see every year, and I like the song. And then there's one by Mariah Carey that I can't get through the season without hearing, and I'm not necessarily excited about that one. But nonetheless, there it is. But there are others as well that really have nothing to do uh, with Christ. Uh, I was in music class in elementary school, and we had, and and I don't, somehow this, this was, we had to sing carols. You know, it was a required class. I don't know why I said that, because you're looking at me going, you went to a music class? I had to. So I did. I like music. I just, I'm just not a singer. But they, Good King Wenceslas. Do you know that song? Most of these songs now are just background music for Hallmark movies and commercials for cars. But nonetheless, Good King Wenceslas. I remember it was about 10 years ago. I just start, this song is in my head. I can't get it out of my head. And I would just start humming it. I remember my dad, we were home one day in the summer. And he just stopped me and said, why in the world are you humming Good King Wenceslas? I said, I don't know, but it's a great song. You want to sing it? And he said, no. And then I had to quit humming it. 
Do you know, good King Wenceslas, you know, he looked down on the Feast of Stephen. It's not really a Christmas song, it's a Boxing Day song. St. Stephen's Day is Boxing Day. Do you care? Do you know? Now you have something to research this afternoon after, during the ball games, right? It's actually about December 26th. It's an interesting song when you read the lyrics. Then there's this one. Have you heard, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow? You've heard this, right? Do you know why that song was written and what it's about? It was written about a heat wave in California. During December, when the writer said, man, I just wish it would snow. It really has nothing to do with Christ, barely Christmas, it'd be a great song to sing at Christmas in Australia, because right now in Australia, it's summertime. Let it snow, wouldn't you love, we're, we're, you can't even fathom a heat wave today. You've, you're wearing sweaters you didn't even know you had, right? It's so cold in Florida. And then there's this great Christmas song, Do You Hear What I Hear? You know what that one's about? That's right, absolutely, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, <laughs> Google it, you'll discover that's true. What? Some of you are right now got the phones out, I know. It was written about peace on earth during the Cuban Missile Crisis because we thought the world was going to blow up with war games. That's what it was about. Christmas songs. But then there's Joy to the World, which is also not about Christmas, primarily. It's not focused on the incarnation of Christ, but it is focused on his coming, but his second coming. We kind of talked about that last night. It's about all the bowing before Christ and acknowledging him as king. It's about the curse of sin being removed forever. It's about the glorious kingdom of God, and it's about the nations glorifying him. It is a wonderful song because it sings of creation repeating the sounding joy. It is a proclamation of a coming day. So why do we sing it at Christmas? Because you can't look ahead at the fulfillment of all that God has promised without acknowledging the promises that he has already fulfilled. The birth of Christ is our focus today and this season as it should be. But the birth is not the end of the story. Christmas puts the nativity scene back out so that we can look back at a promise fulfilled, but the joy that resounds within Christ's followers is not centered on a moment in history, but in a story that continues and leads to a glorious moment of victory yet to come. So when we sing the song, we proclaim the ultimate joy found in the Christ who was born in the manger as prophesied, as fulfilled, as God's plan had laid out. God the Son, Son of God, born to Mary in a manger in Bethlehem as the prophets foretold. And when we sing that, we proclaim that ultimate joy in Christ and what he has done and what he continues to do, and that which is to come. In Luke chapter 2, just to remind us, verses 15 and 16, when the angels went away from them, from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Then you jump to the end book, the last book, penned by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John. In Revelation chapter 21, the first five verses. John says, I then saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. In a season of First Baptist Church family members, that verse resonates a little more loudly today than maybe for others. In a church family that's had over 70 funerals in the last two and a half years, we pause and we thank God for that. That death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning. Mourning, not mourning as in the sun rising, mourning as in despair and grief. Nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Joy to the world. Let heaven and nature sing. We'll close here. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike to come. He's going to close us in a song. I'll give you one guess to guess what song we're going to sing. 
We may not do all the verses just simply because we don't have them on the screen and most of us only memorize the first and last. So, but we do ask you to join in this hymn of the faith as we sing of the truth of what God has promised and what God continues to promise. Father, we come to you now and we thank you for who you are and all that you've done. We thank you for the Christ, your son, fully God, fully man, come from, as planned from before the beginning of time to redeem the world and to bring us hope, to give us life, to be the word, to be the truth. Thank you, Father, for Christmas season as it gives us moments to pause on that which really matters for the season, the greatest gift ever given, the gift that was waited, for, waited on for centuries by your people. And we have the great honor, the great privilege. Lord, we, we ask you to forgive us for, for just making this minimal at times. But we have the great privilege of looking back in history and looking through scripture to see how you fulfilled that promise in Christ being born. But Lord, I thank you that he was born in Bethlehem to fulfill all that prophesied that he would be, but that he also grew in favor with God and man. That he became and he was and he always has been your son. That he lived the perfect life, that he died on the cross of Calvary, that he rose again three days later, ascended into heaven and said, I will be back. My father knows the time. And when the time is right, I will come. And in that moment, we live between these two arrivals of the sun. We thank you, Father, we have the rearview mirror to look back on what you have done, but we also look ahead to what the scripture has foretold. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. May we worship you in spirit and truth in this moment. For those watching online, those in the room that do not know you personally, may today be their, their day of salvation to recognize that Christ has come for them and for your glory and our good. For it is in Jesus' name I pray, 